Okay, so the so the title of Bruno's thesis, I mean, <laughs> the title of my thesis is Evolutionary Changes in Development Associated with a Transition in Larval Nutritional Mode in Spiralians. So there is large diversity in animal morphology, right? There's a lot of weird animals out there. <laughs> and most animals develop from a single fertilized egg or a zygote. And the diversity we get in body form comes from evolutionary changes in development that result in these different body morphologies. So how do we change, or how do we study these evolutionary changes in development? One way to do this is to study a single evolutionary event by comparing two species in which have, that have diverged. For example, in echinoids, Heliosideris tuberculata and erythrogramma, um, one species has feeding larvae, one has non-feeding larvae, and by comparing these two species, which has been done a lot, we can get insight into that evolutionary transition, which gives a lot of detail about the evolutionary transition, um, but there is some problems with it. The other way is to study, a, to study a replicated evolutionary event that has occurred multiple times um, across several taxa. So, to study a single evolutionary event is great because you can get a lot of detail, but it is unclear how general the results of that study can be applied. So by looking at repeated evolutionary event, we can apply those results to a larger range. So in the field of evolution and development, it's a lot more common to compare two species that have diverged. Um, but it's a lot more rare to find a phylogenetic comparison, so looking at repeated evolution. So what I'm doing in this is looking at a repeated evolutionary event in developmental changes, or evolutionary changes in development. So there are multiple evolutionary, uh, multiple transitions in larval nutritional mode in marine invertebrates. So marine invertebrates, like this sea urchin here, many of them have a life cycle similar to this. They have a benthic adult that sits on the bottom, uh, they have larvae that swim in the plankton and eventually metamorphosis back into an adult. And the larval nutritional mode is the way in which the larvae get energy. There's two main ways in which they can do this. One, so we have feeding larvae. They get their energy by feeding on food particles in the plankton, also called planktotrophic larvae. They develop from small energy poor eggs. They generally have a long planktonic duration. Because of that, they have a high geographic dispersal, and so a large geographic range. So because they have a, um, uh, a large geographic range, they have lower extinction rates because a local catastrophe will not affect the whole population. Now, you all, because of the high dispersal, you also get a lot of gene flow between populations. So you have lower speciation rates because there's less genetic differentiation between those populations. This is the opposite for non-feeding larvae, also called lesotropic, that develop from large eggs, uh, large energy-rich eggs. Now, if you look at the, so here we have feeding larvae, here you have non-feeding larvae. So the feeding larvae have more complex uh, feeding and swimming structures, whereas non-feeding larvae, some of them are just blobs. They don't have any feeding structures they have very small feeding or swimming structures. So the transitions between larval nutritional mode have happened quite a bit in marine invertebrates. So one example is in, um, so that is red, <laughs> so is in the gastropod uh, family Caltriidae. So this is a phylogeny in which they inferred the evolutionary transition of larval nutritional mode. And so they inferred that um, species with feeding larvae evolved into species with non-feeding larvae, that this, this transition occurred 19 times. In the opposite direction, it occurred three times. So let's take a closer look. So this is just a zoom in on one part of that. So, um, so the inferred um, ancestral trait is feeding larvae. Here we have an evolutionary loss in feeding, and so this whole clade lost larval feeding. Um, and so that's generally the um, that's the most common um, most common evolutionary transition we see is from feeding to non-feeding. We also see this in conus. 
gastropods and um, echinoids, and it mostly happens from feeding larvae to non-feeding larvae. So our current understanding of how this happens is we begin with the species with feeding larvae. And there are evolutionary increases in energy content as yolk and so the egg gets bigger. And so the descendants of those, the descendants of those that had um, feeding larvae eventually lose the ability to feed. And we're not really sure what developmental changes are associated with that larval, that loss in larval feeding. What is happening that they lose, they lose the ability to feed? So then what happens is the ancestors of those, the larvae, um, have a reduction in time to metamorphosis. So they spend less time in the plankton, which means reduced mortality in the plankton. And then due to that less time in the plankton, those larval feeding and swimming structures are needed less. And so the relaxed <coughs> evolution means um, they get those larval feeding structures become lost. So, Again, the developmental changes underlying the loss of feeding um, have not been identified. So there is some evidence in the clade of Spiralia that there may be a change, there may be some change in uh, development that's associated with that transition. So Spiralia is a really large group of marine, and, well, mostly marine invertebrates. Um, and that include annelids and mollusks. Mollusks, second most species, animal species risk, second most species risk, uh, phyla, animal phyla, phylum. Um, <laughs> and um, most of these, or a lot of these, actually have spiral cleavage, um, including annelids, mollusks, and a few other clades. So, what is spiral cleavage? So spiral cleavage, so we're looking at a single cell, a zygote, right? The animal pole is like the top, the vegetal pole is the bottom. So we have first cleavage, divides into two cells. Second cleavage, divides into four cells. So up here is a side view, and down here is an animal pole view. So we're looking at it like we're looking down here, so we're looking, right? And so then we have third cleavage, and we have um, larger macromeres at the vegetal pole, and smaller, mic smaller micromeres at the animal pole. <coughs> and so why these are highlighted in yellow is because the macromeres eventually become, or the descendants of the macromeres eventually become the, the gut and the endoderm of the larvae. Now, for my thesis, this presentation only, if you Google it, you won't find this term, <laughs> macromere allocation um, is the total amount of volume in the eight cell stage that is allocated to just the macromeres. Okay, so whenever I refer to macromere allocation, I'm talking about the total cytoplasm that's allocated to right here. Okay, so one thing that's really important about spiralians is that, or species with spiral cleavage, is that they have a highly conserved cell fate. So what do I mean by that? So this is a cell fate map for Crepidula fornicata, gastropod. So how we read this is we start off with single cell zygote. We have first cleavage, we have two cells, we have second cleavage, four cells. Now the letters are just nomenclature for species with spiral cleavage. Now let's follow one of these through. So that C cell then divides into one big C, uppercase C, which is a macromere, and one little C, which is a micromere. And that continues to divide, more micromeres uh, divide off. And so when we get down to here to 4C, this, um, this macromere, its descendants will become the stomach, right? And the style sac and a few other things. So if you look here at this 64 cell stage, all these macromeres become the gut and the stomach. And so when I say this is highly conserved among species with spiral cleavage, is so what I mean is that this cell fate map can practically be, be applied to um, any other species with spiral cleavage. These cell fates are highly conserved. They're very, very similar in other species. <coughs> so now that evidence I talked about about associated change with the loss in larval feeding. So there seems to be some evidence, it's anecdotal mostly, um, that in, um, in the species with larger eggs, there's relatively more volume 
in the macromere. So there's a higher macromere allocation. So here is a gastropod example. Um, so here's Capitula fornicata, smaller egg than Busicon. But you can see that those macromeres are relatively much larger. And then here's an analyte example. Um, again, smaller eggs. The macromeres you can barely see because they're almost the same size as the micromeres. And then here the macromeres are relatively larger than the ones in here. So there seems to be um, a possible association between um, macromere allocation and egg size. Maybe. Okay, so why the macromeres though? How might the macromeres impact the loss of larval feeding? Okay. So there's two possible effects. If there's so increased um, cytoplasm in the macromeres, which go to endoderm, right? So if there's so much more, so we have this small egg, um, there's the macromeres, it, in gastrulation, it goes in, eventually gonna form the gut, right? Then we have a much larger egg, full of yolk, um, full of energy, and now gastrulation is a lot like that. That can't, it's harder for the, the gut to um, develop in there because there's not as much space. So there's one thing that could be going on. The other is that larger, um, cells divides more slowly, right? And so it may take longer for a gut to develop. So this was found to be true in uh, Strebelus bio benedicti. So uh, Pernay and McHugh found that larvae from large eggs uh, had a delay in the development of a gut. So right here, so muscle band number is like a developmental timing. So it's a way to kind of stage the embryos. And then this is percent of broods with feeding larvae. So the black bars are, um, so, <coughs> forgot about this, so Strebelus bio, <laughs> some individuals, some females make large eggs and some make small eggs. So we find this um, interesting variation just in one species. So the black bars represent uh, large eggs and the white small eggs. So larvae with, um, larvae from, that develop from small eggs have a, their gut develops earlier than the ones that than the ones from large eggs. Okay, so from this, I get two hypotheses. One is an evolutionary increase in egg size is associated with an increase in macromere allocation. The other is an evolutionary increase in egg size is associated with a delay in the formation of a functional gut. Okay, so in addition to egg size, um, there may also be this association of macromere allocation and formation of a functional gut with the loss of, um, with like this evolutionary transition in our larval nutritional mode. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm going to test both of these hypotheses in a single evolutionary transition. And a great clade to do that is, is in Calyptriidae, a family of gastropods that includes the genus Crepidula, which, else, which are called slipper snails. And slipper snails, we call this because they have this little shelf, like little slippers you can put on babies or something. <laughs> um, so adults are suspension feeders. So they have mucus over their gills, food particles get caught in there, they bring the mucus to their mouth and then they eat it. They're sequential hermaphrodites, which is pretty neat. So when they're young, they're juveniles and then they become males. And as they grow older, they lose their penis and become females. So bigger ones are females. So like most species, the mature ones are the females. Uh, <laughs> Crepidula fornicata, the, form these stacks where the larger individuals down here are females and the one, the smaller individuals on top are males. You know, big sex stack. So um, <laughs> in, in um, Calyptriidae, this, uh, so evolutionary transitions in larval nutritional mode have occurred, like I mentioned before, around 22 times. So it's a great clay to study this in. Now, um, Crepidula fornicata is a really highly studied species of this, of this clay. And it's even actually been proposed as a as a model system for spiralian development. Mm. And this is its larvae, it has feeding larvae. Uh, this, I forgot about this. So this, this is how they brood their eggs. They deposit their <coughs> eggs and then they sit on them till they're ready to hatch. Okay, so 
a great species to compare Crampidula fornicata to is Crampidula williamsi. Bet you never heard of it. I didn't either. <laughs> is, um, it's a really easily collected species here in the uh, whole west coast. I'm pretty sure mainly just Southern California. Okay, so, um, so Crampidula williamsi lives inside turbine snail shells that are inhabited by hermit crabs. So they're like, live, they're snails that live inside snails, they're like snail inception, kind of. Um, <laughs> and so here's a one removed from the snail shell, and here's an adult, a little tiny adult, a male, sorry, this is a male, this is an adult female. So Crepidula williamsi has not been studied much, and uh, it has not been compared to Crepidula fornicata. And so they are closely related, not just because they're close, but they actually are its sister taxa to Crepidula fornicata. And so this right here, this evolutionary transition, they lost um, their the <coughs> larval feeding. So great to compare. Okay, so I have those two hypotheses I mentioned before, macromere allocation with egg size and um, egg size and delay in the formation of a gut. So I'm going to test both of these hypotheses um, by comparing egg size, macromere allocation, and gut development of Crepidula williamsi and Crepidula fornicata. However, like I said before, this is, this is great for finding out detail, this single evolutionary event, but the results of this, it's unclear how, how well these can be applied to other evolutionary transitions. So, to do that, a phylogenetic comparative analysis can test hypotheses regarding common developmental changes associated with an evolutionary change in egg size. So, how are phylogenetic comparative analyses, or why are they useful? So, let's say we're comparing two traits right here. And we have um, each one of these points is a species. So, it looks like a simple, like a, like a nice, pretty, linear relationship. Um, so OLS uh, regression assumes that data points are independent. So this can be misleading, right? Because some species are more closely related than other species. So these points are not independent. So if we're looking at a single evolutionary transition, we have um, this really is one comparison if this is like the true phylogeny these are all closely related and these are all closely related so if we're looking at an evolutionary transition this is not uh, a regression is not a OLS regression is not appropriate here so um, what I used was a phylogenetic generalized least squares so it is a phylogenetic comparative analysis um, in some ways it is similar to a regression except that it accounts for phylogeny okay? so it's called PGLS so there's a lot of information on egg size and larval nutritional mode in the literature about a lot of different Spirelian species. And many of these descriptions include images of cell of embryos at the eight cell stage. So what I did is I used a PGLS to test the hypothesis that egg size is associated with macromere allocation. So purpose of study, showing you the hypotheses again so you don't forget. <laughs> um, so I'm comparing these two and testing both of these hypotheses, okay, right? I'm testing one, the one hypothesis with my phylogenetic comparison, but the results can be more broadly applied, okay? So first, I'm gonna talk about this, talk about my methods, okay? So I collected adult Crepidula williamsi um, from two locations in the Palos Verdes Peninsula, White Point and Trump Golf Course. Um, I brought the adults back, kept them in plastic cups, and I removed the broods right here um, as I needed them for measurements. Um, so to estimate volume, uh, zygote volume and diameter, I um, isolated embryos, took pictures of them, I measured two diameters, and then I modeled the volume as a sphere. And then what I did is I followed individual embryos to the eight cell stage, took pictures of the macromeres, and then here are the micromeres, tiny little things. And then I did the same thing, I took diameters, modeled the, as uh, volume as a sphere, and then I estimated macromere allocation, so macromere volume divided by the total eight cell stage volume. So I did this for both Crepidula, Williams, and Crepidula fornicata. 
Now, um, to get the timing of developmental events for early cleavage, I took, um, so I took Crepidula Williamsi embryos, I isolated individual ones and checked every two hours until they reached the six, 16 cell stage. I started at first cleavage, the two cell stage, because it was really hard to catch them, in, catch uh, adult females in the middle of deposition. So for later developmental events, I kept the embryos in the broods and I checked them daily. If over 50% had reached um, the, the, the developmental event, then I counted it as having reached it. And I'm gonna talk about these in more detail in a minute, but these are the ones I, I timed. Okay, so when I also need to look at external morphology and gut development. So my general preparation is I relax the embryos, I fix them in paraformaldehyde, I decalcified them, their shells, if they had one. Um, Post-fix in osmium tetro tetroxide and sodium bicarbonate, then dehydrated with ethanol. And so then, <coughs> if I'm for prep for SEM, for external morphology, I then critically point dried, mounted on studs, and then I viewed with an SEM. Whereas if I was sectioning for gut development, I transferred to propylene oxide and then I embedded in plastic and sectioned with an ultramicrotome. So juvenile size, since the uh, broods were isolated from the, their mothers, I waited till they hatched on their own and measured shell length. I then fed uh, juvenile algae to see if they could eat and how they were eating and then I uh, fixed them and cleared their soft tissue with glycerol so I could use the, so I could actually use the, the algae as like a digestive system highlighter. Okay, so my results of this part. So zygote size, so um, the average zygote diameter of Crepidula fornicata is 420 microns. Now, I did see a lot of uh, uh, variation between broods because I measured 10 different broods. And so I ran an ANOVA on the uh, volume, on the, the zygote volume, and found that there was significant difference. So there's a lot of intraspecific variation, which is not really that unusual. Other species of Crepidula and other species of marine invertebrates have shown this, but this will be useful for later, and I'll tell you why. And it's most likely due to some sort of maternal effect that was not accounted for. Okay, so timing of developmental events. I'm gonna go over these in more detail in a minute, I promise. Um, so one brood I was able to follow from deposition to the two cell state. It took about 36 to 45 hours. Um, here's the timing for each one of these. And so here, this is Pigula Williams I, four cell stage. Here it is at the villager stage. Um, and so here's anterior, here's anterior here. Um, this is the head vesicle stage, and this is the juvenile stage. Okay, so now comparing with Crepidula fornicata. So Crepidula fornicata has much smaller eggs. These are to scale, so you can see that there's quite a big, quite a bit of a difference. It is a significant difference. Macromere allocation also 96% um, in macromere um, in Crepidula fornicata, but 98% on Crepidula williams eye. Also significant. Okay, comparison of the villager stage. So Crepidula fornicata, um, <coughs> once it develops its velum, it, become, it eventually becomes <coughs> fully functional. So the velum is these big lobes that have all these cilia over, and it propels it through the water and then it um, picks up food particles and delivers it to the mouth. And so you can even see the, the intestine right here. So this is, they're feeding at this point. Now, Crepidula williams eye has the little pathetic excuse for venom. It's like, <laughs> it's version of T-Rex arms. It's like there, but it doesn't do much. Um, so they have cilia on it, and they actually move around in the capsules, but they don't capture food because they don't have a gut. And they're in a capsule. They haven't hatched yet, so there's no real reason for them to necessarily have them. So their velum is highly, highly reduced. Eventually the shell develops, the foot develops, um, the larval kidneys develop, and they have nothing to do with our kidneys. They have to do with uh, protein absorption in the capsular fluid. Um, and then you can even see the butt of the tentacle. Um, and so then we get the head vesicle stage, which you still have the, the velum right here. The head vesicle is this large bulbous extension right above the head. Um, 
the shell you can see is starting to get bigger. Um, and so this head vesicle in Crepidula williams eye is like actually chock full of yolk. So here's a later head vesicle stage. You can see the shell is growing anteriorly and the head vesicle is shrinking. And here's even later, now this is sectioning, so this is a sagittal section. Here's the head vesicle, um, and you can see it's full of yolk. And here, where the stomach will eventually develop, is again full of yolk. So they're not feeding yet, right? And they, their villager stage didn't even resemble that, really. It's like a hairy lump. Um, <laughs> So now looking at the juvenile stage. So Crepidula fornicata, so they settle out of the uh, plankton, whereas Crepidula limbs I hatch out. So they don't spend any time in the plankton. Um, and they're a little bit bigger. And so hatched uh, Crepidula limbs I uh, juvenile. So here is, I fed it algae, and then I killed it and cleared it. And so, um, this, all this color, all this dye you see here, is from the algae that it ate. So you can see the stomach, the digestive gland, and even the intestine. So then the anus will be somewhere here. And these are its eyes. Um, and so now it's finally able to feed, and it is feeding by suspension feeding. I even watched them do it. They caught the particles in, their, in the mucus, brought the food to their mouth. It was adorable. <laughs> um, so now the gut development of Crepidula williams eye. So, the gut didn't start developing until the head vesicle was gone, completely gone. And so first, uh, an esophagus starts to develop, but it has nowhere to go. It's just a dead end because look, just still full of yolk. Now, um, here is a later stage. So this is, again, sagittal section, but it's not in the midline, so you don't see the esophagus, but I promise you it's there. It's just in a different section. But here you can see the stomach actually developing. You can see it's actually full of yolk. So the stomach is developing and it has yolk in it. So it's not complete yet. The esophagus does not uh, connect with the stomach yet. And now, um, so this, this is anterior, this is anterior, and then this one goes against the grain pointing the other direction. And so, right, you can't see it very well, but um, right here is the esophagus, and then here's the stomach, and it connects back there. And here's the intestine. So finally, um, the, the stomach fully forms, um, and it is able to eat. But this happens, as you can see, there's no head vesicle. It happens way after that stage. <clears throat> okay, so I just looked at these two tests. I just tested these two hypotheses in that comparison between these two. So now I'm going to look at this one with the phylogenetic comparison. Okay, so, um, so I'm looking for evolutionary changes in development associated with changes in egg size. So what I did is I had obtained images of eight cell stage embryos for 44 spiralians. 38 of these species were from the literature, and six of them were from my own observation. Um, for all of these species, I uh, collected data on three things. Um, egg size, so I got this from the literature or my own measurements. Larval nutritional mode, which I got from the literature. Um, and then images of the eight cell stage, which then I used to um, get estimates of, of macromere allocation, just like how I did with Crepidula williams I took the measurements of all of the sphere. Um, so then what I did is I made a composite tree um, with the most recent published phylogenies that included all the species I was looking at. So this, this tree has 44 um, analyzed species, uh, 19 annelids, 25 mollusks. But now if you counted them, which don't, um, <laughs> you would see that there's what looks like 26 mollusks. Now, Alderia willowi is a single species, but some broods are large eggs and some broods are small eggs. So for the sake of the analysis, I treated it as two separate species, even though it's not truly two separate species. Okay, so then the previously mentioned PGLS I talked about, Phylogenetic generalized least squares. So I ran three analyses. First, I wanted to make sure the assumption that I made in the beginning, the egg volume and larval nutritional mode um, are indeed correlated phylogenetically. So I'm just confirming that is true for these species. And then I'm testing the hypothesis, macromere allocation, <laughs> egg volume. And then I ran the analysis on macromere allocation and larval nutritional mode. Okay. So was my assumption correct? So if I look at the raw data, so it's not corrected for the phylogeny, 
Um, it looks like there's a difference between feeding and non-feeding species in um, egg size. So then I run a PGLS to make sure that that is true. And so what I did, when I, when I ran the PGLS, I ran it for all species, Spiralia, together, and then I um, ran it for just annelids and just mollusks as well. And so it is significant for all of those. Yay, assumption's true. <laughs> okay, so then, is there association between egg volume and macromere allocation? So this is the raw data again. I mean, it's transformed, but it's not corrected for phylogeny. Um, so it looks like there's a nice, pretty linear regression. But, again, it's not corrected for phylogeny. So, um, oh, before I move on though. So here we have, um, so each of these is so like, annelid feeding, annelid non-feeding. So the ones that are filled in, those are non-feeding species, um, where the ones that are not filled in are feeding species. So you notice most of the black points are to the right because they have larger eggs. Okay, so I ran that PGLS, and again, significant. Woo! <laughs> um, so then I took the, um, the equation that the PGLS gave me, and plotted that line. And you can see they are similar, but this one is accounting for phylogeny, and so I mean, it's gonna be a little bit different. Okay, so is there an association between larval and nutritional and macromere allocation? So again, looking at the raw data, like that looks like there's a difference, that does not. Um, but again, not corrected for phylogeny, which does reveal um, there was significant. Um, and even though it's like 0.05, that was like 0.049. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, so back to the purpose of my study. Um, so now let's discuss things. Okay, so here we're going to, um, I'm going to talk about the comparison of Crepidula forticata, these two, these two hypotheses. So we know now Crepidula williamsi has larger eggs, higher macromere allocation, um, and a later developing gut, right? This is smaller than that. Um, and so, yay, it supports my hypotheses. <laughs> cool. Okay, so now I actually have, we, there are, I don't, but there are two studies, the Strebelus B01 done by Pernay and McHugh, um, and this one that I just did that support that changes in egg size um, are associated with a change in, or a delay in the development of a gut. So we have two studies for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, the, the phylogenetic comparative analysis in that one hypothesis. So my results suggest this is what's happening, right? I have a, a zygote, evolutionary increases in egg size, here are the macromeres, boom, they're bigger. So that seems to be what's happening. Um, so uh, why? Why does macromere allocation increase with egg size? So there's two possible things that could be going on. So there's a, um, I mean there's probably more, but so it could be a direct effect of increased egg size. So um, it could possibly be due to um, constraints on the mitotic spindling. So what this means is a direct effect, so increased egg size, increased macromere allocation, compared to indirect, which would be, um, so increased macromere allocation would have some sort of evolutionary selective advantage. Um, so, so when there's a, like, a selective advantage for a change in cleavage or um, uh, cellular size, we call this an adaptation of cleavage. So is it just kind of an automatic response, or is it um, evolutionary selected for increased macromere allocation. Okay, so let's talk about direct effect first. <coughs> so maybe there's an unchanged mitotic spindle. So if at the third cleavage, we're looking at it, so here is, yeah, so here's the mitotic spindle, right? Um, that line is the cleavage plane, so that's what separates, this will become the macromeres, this will become the micromeres, so this is at the four cell stage. Um, so if at third cleavage, one end of the mitotic spindle is attached to the animal pole, which was found to be true in Corbidula fornicata with Tyler and Kimball. Um, and if the length of that mitotic spindle does not change, so here we have evolutionary increases in egg size, so it stayed attached, mitotic spindle stayed the same length, 
then increases in egg size will just kind of automatically make those macromeres relatively larger, right? Um, so let's look at um, let's look at spindling. So um, here in this study and a few others, they looked at how spindling scales with cell size, and so they looked in this at this in um, Xenopus frogs, and so in this study right here, they looked at they looked at it in cell diameter and droplet diameter. So it's the diameter of the cell. Um, so droplets is like a fake cell. Here's spindle length. So how does it scale? So down here we have a linear relationship. So as the droplet or the cell increases, so does the mitotic spindle. But then it has an asymptote right here. And it has like a maximum length in which the, the mitotic spindle can't get, uh, or doesn't seem to get any bigger. Um, okay, so I can use this data to model macromere allocation um, of embryos of different sizes. Okay, so what I do, or what I did, is using a geometric model. So one end, so I'm making these assumptions with this model, right? One end of the mitotic spindle is attached to the animal pole. The mitotic spindle scales with cell size, as I just described, and that the cleavage plane um, occurs right in the middle of the uh, mitotic spindle. And so using that, I made predictions about data. So this is all just predictions based on their data. So this is untransformed, and this is transformed because I did do the PGLS transform. So um, you see this kind of pattern, right? So it increases kind of linearly, and then there's like a maximum length it hits, okay? So this is just the model, and so what does it look like when I put the data I collected for my, for my phylogenetic comparative analysis on this predictive model? Well, it looks pretty close. Um, so yeah, so here's the data. It seems to correspond really well with that model. This suggests um, that, that there is a direct response to um, the increase in egg size, there's a direct response to the macro with the increased macromere allocation. Not necessarily a selective advantage, this is just kind of what happens due to constraints on the spindle length. This is the pattern of the spindle, and this is what I see, or what we see. Um, so how do we test this? Um, uh, how do we further test this? So in many species of spirulins, does spindle length vary within uh, cell size assumed by the model? So again, I didn't measure spindle size, um, so somebody could go, not me, and uh, <laughs> measure spindle size. Now, um, also, does experimentally enlarging zygotes lead to an increase in macromere allocation? So if it is a direct response, and I, I uh, increase oil into a cell, make it bigger, does the, um, does the macromere allocation just automatically get bigger after that? That'd be a direct response. Another is, does intraspecific variation in zygote size affect macromere allocation? Remember how I talked about um, intraspecific variation earlier? Yeah? It's coming back. <laughs> okay, so I did this in Crepidula Williams eye. I had zygote volume and macromere allocation, and these are individual embryos that I measured, and it looks like, hey, bigger cells or bigger zygotes have higher macromere allocation. But there's a problem here, right? So I did this from 10 broods, and so this is not accounting for what data point the brood comes from. So I'm considering each of these data points independent. Now, if I take into account what brood they belong to, the relationship gets a little wacky, right? <laughs> so some of them have nice positive relationships, some of them don't have a relationship, some of them have a negative relationship. Not really sure what's going on, probably some sort of maternal effect, but this could be measured in other species to see if this is true. Um, okay, so now the other thing, that's all direct response. Now let's talk about indirect response. So an evolutionary advantage to having increased macromere allocation. So there's a smaller surface area to volume ratio, ratio in larger embryos. Remember that from like Bio 101? Um, so Ziegler and Raff suggest that decreased cytoplasm um, allocated ectodermal lineages would be advantageous. So they found in Clipiaster um, rosaceus, okay, it has larger eggs than several other echinoids, um, 
And so they said less of that volume goes to the ectoderm, which is on the outside of the embryo, because less is needed to cover up the high volume of the larger embryo. They don't necessarily say why it should go to the endoderm or and why not the mesoderm, they just say less ectoderm. Um, another possibility is that um, this increase in egg size is due, well, it is due to um, added yolk, because yolk is energy, right, lipids. So it may be that yolk is targeted to the cells with endodermal fates, so the macromeres, um, because that's where it's ultimately processed. It goes to the gut, maybe that's where it gets broken down. So um, Schneider found that in macromeres, and so looked at two, these two species of platinarias, and so they looked at the composition of yolk versus clear cytoplasm in micromeres versus macromeres. So this is like one macromere, one micromere, right? And so they found that in micromeres, there is, or in macromeres, there's a higher proportion of the yolk, right? So if we expected maybe not, um, maybe a, like an, in, uh, an indirect evolutionary selective advantage, we may, okay, let me start that over. <laughs> so if it was a direct response, then wouldn't the yolk be evenly distributed between those cells? So the yolk is being allocated to the um, macromeres specifically here. Um, now, this is only done in two species. Maybe, 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 or maybe not, it's true in others. Um, so that is a perfect possible future study. Okay, so conclusion. So both my single um, comparison, C. fornicata, C. williams I, um, and the comparative analysis are consistent with my original hypotheses. You gotta hear them one more time. <laughs> then, increases in egg size associated with increase in macromere allocation, and evolutionary increases in egg size associated with the delay in the formation of a functional gut. Both are supported. Okay, so this is the first phylogenetic comparative analysis on mollusks and annelids with like development, or I think just mollusks and annelids. Um, and so <coughs> this can be applied to over 200,000 species. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of species. Let me hear you talk about that, fish people. Okay, <laughs> um, so this pattern indicates a common developmental change in multiple transitions in larval nutritional mode. So now what we can do is we can determine the mechanism behind this process of an increased macro allocation. Is it a direct effect? Is it a direct, indirect effect? I don't know. Okay. Now, acknowledgments. Thank you, Bruno, for your patience and your help and your patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Stangwich, for help with all your stats. Brian Livingston, for your suggestions, all part of my committee. Um, Dr. Johnson, for your help on stats. Dr. Stangwich, you're still my main squeeze for stats. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, just on the side. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Tom, for your help for training me and using the microtail. Um, and only calling me an idiot so many times. <laughs> um, thank you, Gerard and Gordon Handler from the um, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles for um, using their SEM and training there. Um, thank you for to my lab mates or lab family really for your help in collecting and listening to me complain. <laughs> um, David, Andrea, Caitlin, Amber, Zyra, Amberly, um, friends in my grad program. I love you guys so. Great. <laughs> um, and my family, my sister Kylie's here from Montana. Yay! Um, my Pippin, he couldn't make it. <laughs> dog, EFF, and Cuddle Buddy. Um, and Maria, oh my god, thank you so much for <laughs> coming with me on this crazy adventure to California and making those amazing muppets. <laughs> I love you. Aww.